Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's meeting of the IET Sussex Local Network. I'm Greg Hobbs, uh, and I'm here tonight to introduce Guy Davidson, who is our speaker from Creative Assembly, who's going to talk to us about game software engineering, 40 years of game development. Since the release of Pong in 1972, the games industry has proven to be proven to be a very resilient industry that now surpasses music, film and television all combined in the revenues that it generates. In his talk this evening, Guy will take uh, the engineer's perspective of how, these, of how things have developed from simple TTL devices attached to cathode ray tubes to the sprawling 10 million line C++ code bases that are part of modern games today, and also how the role of the engineer has kept pace with it. Guy Davidson has been making games for over 40 years now. His first was on an Acorn Atom. His last, or at least his latest, was as part of Creative Assembly's Total War franchise team. With a brief interruption for a mathematics degree, for some time in theater, multimedia, and bizarrely in finance, it has been his continuing passion. You can find Guy in Brighton and Hove playing piano, teaching Tai Chi, raising children, and engaging in local politics. So I'm very happy to welcome you this evening, Guy, to our meeting. And uh, thank you very much for finding the time to come and talk to us today. Uh, I will now hand the screen over to you and come and join you at the end for the Q&A. Hello, yes, my name is Guy Davidson. Um, I'm the Principal Coding Manager at Creative Assembly. Uh, we make the Total War franchise, but besides that, we also make Alien Isolation and Halo Wars 2 uh, and many other titles actually stretching back to the 80s. It's the UK's largest and oldest game developer. We have nearly 800 staff in Horsham and Sofia, Bulgaria. We've just opened our third building in Horsham. Um, we have a motion capture studio in Burgess Hill. I joined Creative Assembly in 1999, and I'm, I'm delighted to work there. I'm going to talk to you today about game development from the perspective of over 40 years of writing games. Let's have a look at a bit of CA Live. people really. Um, so what you can expect, the first half of this talk is a history of computer gaming and then we'll look at how to write a game and we'll look at the programming languages used for writing games and then finally we'll take a very high level look at how to make a Total War game. So would anyone like to guess what the first game was? So through this I'd kind of like you to put stuff in the chat window so that we can interact. I know that you're still there but I still have an audience. So I'm going to give you a few moments to guess what the first computer game was. Hmm. Wow, look at this. Was it Pong? Tic-tac-toe? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, no, Space War, old Unix game, Space War. Chess. Chess, James. Tell me about chess. Oh no, James isn't going to be able to tell me about chess because so many people are filling up the chat buffer. Colossal Caves Adventure. That's some really good answers. Um, the computer version of the board game. Yeah, that's, do you know what? I'm going to. Give you that one. Um, it's actually called Chiro Champ. Uh, yeah, th this is my presentation, they're my rules. You can define a game any way you like, really, but as far as I'm concerned, 
The first game was Chiro Champ, which was a chess program written in 1948 by this gentleman, Alan Turing, along with David Champanan. Now, its algorithm was actually too complex to be run by the early computers of the time. Um, so in 1948, we had the pilot's automatic computing engine, um, which was what he was working on at the time. Um, Turing actually did attempt to convert the program into executable code for the 1951 Ferranti Mark I computer in Manchester. Um, but he was able to do so. It was just too big, too much to ask. Turing did actually play a match against a computer scientist called Alec Glenny using the program in the summer of 1952. Uh, he executed it manually, step by step. Uh, but by his death in 1954, he'd still been unable to run the program on an actual computer. So I am possibly stretching the definition, but Turing's a hero of mine. And that quotation, this is only a foretaste of what's to come and only the shadow of what is going to be. Um, certainly suits the games industry. So our next, well next we have Bertie the Brain. So this was built in Toronto by Joseph Cates for the 1950 Canadian National Exhibition. It featured input and output. On the, uh, on the left there you can see Danny Kay celebrating the victory. Uh, from Wikipedia, uh, a four metre tall computer allowed exhibition attendees to play a game of knots and crosses against an artificial intelligence. An artificial intelligence. I don't really like that word. Um, Tic-tac-toe, noughts and crosses, whatever you want to call it, has a really trivial search path. Um, AI wasn't even a phrase back in 1950. I think people who say AI either don't know how to program or don't know what intelligence is or want money. Um, but I will answer questions about AI later. So let's move on to Nimrod. This computer was chosen, was custom built to play NIM by Ferranti for the 1951 Festival of Britain. Uh, now, th there is a theme of festivals demonstrating engineering prowess with games, and I'll return to this. But this was designed by John Makepeace Bennett, and it was built by Spy oh, Raymond Stuart Williams. Um, and again, Wikipedia uses the phrase artificial intelligence to describe the opponent. Ah, who knows what this is? Um, so staying in Britain, uh, the British computer scientist Christopher Strachey finished a programme for drafts in February 1951. It also was too much for the pilot's automatic computing engine at the National Physical Laboratory that Turing tried to play chess against. But he heard about the Manchester Mark I, um, which has a much bigger memory, and he asked his former fellow student, Alan Turing, for the manual, and he, just, he transcribed the programme into the operation codes of that machine by around October in 1951. And the programme could actually play a complete game of drafts at, uh, and he, he described it at a reasonable speed. I'm sure anyone would have described it as a reasonable speed after undertaking that. So this is a picture of the Electronic Delay Storage Automatic Calculator, or EDSAC. And this is one of the first stored programme computers from 1948. Uh, the game we're talking about here is OXO, Noughts and Crosses, uh, by A.S. Douglas. And this was 1952. And it's not just another Noughts and Crosses game. What's good about this was that the EDSAC used three cathode ray tubes to show the state of memory. And what he did was repurpose one to demonstrate portraying other information to the user besides the state of memory. So it's possibly the first video game since it used a cathode ray tube rather than lamps. Uh, tennis for two, I saw that come up. Um, so we have to move forward six years to 1958 for this. The US physicist uh, William Higginbotham uh, designed this for display at the Brookhaven National Laboratory Annual Public Exhibition. Bit of a show-off moment. Um, the Government Research Institution had a Donham Model 30 analog computer, and it could simulate trajectories with wind resistance. So he designed the game in a few hours, and he built it in three weeks with a technician called Robert Dvorak. Um, he also built a controller. Here's a reproduction. And it was very popular during the three-day exhibition, especially with high school students, apparently who queued for ages to play it, plus a change. The first game purely to be created for entertainment, I think. So, yeah, rather than, you know, commercial technological promotion or academic research, it was just to amuse. It also featured in lawsuits years later. Um, so hold that thought. So now we move on to the coin-operated era. Lawsuits usually follow money, so let's talk about coin-operated machines. Um, anyone know what this is? in the chat window. 
Ooh, bit of latency there. Does no one know? Space War, congratulations. Does anyone know the machine? It is indeed Space War. First arcade machine. No, this is a this is a digital equipment corporation, PDP One, the DEC, PDP One. Um, so this is Space War, which was written at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, by Steve Russell and quite a lot of collaborators. And it features two spaceships maneuvering in the uh, the gravity well of a star while engaged in a dogfight. It was hugely popular. Um, Code was distributed to other installations of the DEC PDP-1, making it the first game to run at multiple sites. Um, if only they'd been able to network themselves together. Students would modify the game and expand on the code, um, which was a pattern that set the way that programming was learned for many years to come, because games are safe sandboxes. They're not traffic control systems. They're not medical imaging devices. They're not nuclear reactors. If there's something wrong, just restart the game. It's fine. You, you know, if there's a bug, just stop the game, start again. Um, in my industry, we find that annoys the customers an enormous amount. Um, so we do try and keep bugs to a minimum. But I can safely say nobody dies as a result of a bug in anything that I've written. So this is computer space. So this is the first video arcade game. Um, and it was created by Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney. And they were in partnership as Syzygy Engineering. Now, they couldn't economically make it run on a computer because it was too expensive to build the thing. So they replaced the computer um, with custom hardware, which was based on Space War, obviously. And it was distributed by a company called Nutting Associates, and they sold about 1,500 units. It also spawned a clone called Star Trek. Intellectual property laws were very different back then. So this is Palm, obviously. Um, now, Bushnell and Dabney incorporated as Atari. And Alan Alcorn, whose name you can see signed at the top left hand corner of the cabinet, created Pong as a training exercise. Uh, but Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney decided to manufacture it because they were so impressed by his work. And so in August 1972, they built a prototype and they put it in a local bar. And then they went away to try and raise money for mass production. There were some issues with the operation. Uh, it started to develop faults and Alan dashed around to try and fix the thing. It turned out that the coin bucket was too small. So many people were putting money in to play the thing that they filled up the coin bucket and it was starting to jam into the innards of the machine. Uh, this piqued a lot of people's interests. And Atari decided to manufacture the machine themselves rather than license it out to, uh, to other manufacturers. They did struggle to raise the money there because the banks looked upon it as a pinball sort of variant. It's like a pinball machine. You put money in the slot and you derive entertainment. And the trouble with pinball in the early 70s was that it was heavily associated with the mafia. Um, it's a lot of cash floating around, unaccounted for, that could just go anywhere at all. So it was a big target for organised crime. But it was hugely successful. Pong sold, it shipped internationally when they started licensing out to so international uh, manufacturers. It was, it was huge, absolutely huge. So fast forward a bit to 1975. Now this game, Gunfight was released by Taito in Japan and in Europe and licensed to Midway in, the, in, in America. It was created by a chap called Tomohiro Nishikado. And it was a simple Western style gunfight gameplay, really. Um, you know, draw, shoot, somebody wins, somebody dies. It used, it used transistor transistor logic chips in the Taito machines. But the reason I've included this is because in Midway machines in America, it was the first game to feature a microprocessor, an Intel 8080, in fact. Uh, it also used a um, bitmap frame buffer technology to display text and graphics. Uh, I've got another talk, if anyone's interested, about the development of displays in general. And I can tell you that the Evans and Sutherland frame buffer, which was released in 1974, cost $15,000. So I'm imagining it was cheaper than that. But this arcade game used a microprocessor and a frame buffer, which shaped the future for some time to come. Again, built by one chap. Now, breakouts, and there's just so much history with breakout. So this was released in May 1976 by Atari, and it was meant as a single player version of Pong. Just one person controlling the bat against a wall of bricks. Um, you can see a color screen there, but actually it was, the colors were created by adding colored strips of cellophane to the display. Um, so I'm gonna quote at length from Wikipedia here, do excuse me, but I find this fascinating. 
So Breakout, a discrete logic game, was designed by Nolan Bushnell, Steve Wozniak, and Steve Bristow. So Alan Alcon was designed, was assigned as the uh, Breakout project manager, and Nolan Bushnell assigned Steve Jobs to design a prototype. So Jobs was offered $750 with an award for every TTL chip fewer than 50. And Jobs promised to complete a prototype within four days. And Bushnell offered the bonus because he disliked how all the new Atari games were requiring so many chips, 150, 170, 180 chips. He knew that Steve Wozniak, who was an employee of, Hew employment, an employee of Hewlett Packard at the time, had designed a version of Pong that used about 30 chips. So Jobs didn't really have specialised knowledge of a circuit board design, but he knew that Wozniak was capable of producing designs with a small number of chips. He convinced Wozniak to work with him, promising to split the fee evenly between them if Wozniak could minimise the number of chips. So he convinced Wozniak to work with him and um, Wozniak had no sketches and instead interpreted the game from its description. So to save parts, he had tricky little designs, as he called them, difficult to understand for most engineers. So near the end of development, Wozniak considered moving the high score to the screen's top, but Jobs claimed Bushnell wanted at the bottom. Um, Wozniak was unaware of any truth to his claims. The original deadline was met after Wozniak worked at Atari for four straight nights. He did some additional designs while he was at, while he was at his day job at Hewlett Packard. And this equated to a bonus of $5,000, which Jobs kept secret from Wozniak. And Wozniak has stated he only received payment of $350. He believed for years that Atari had promised $700 for a design using fewer than 50 chips and $1,000 for fewer than 40. He said in 1984 that we only got 700 bucks for it. Wozniak was the engineer and Jobs was the breadboarder and the tester. Wozniak's original design did use 42 chips. The final working breadboard that he and Jobs delivered to Atari used 44. But Wozniak said that we were so tired we couldn't cut it down. Now, the simplicity of the game created a problem when the copyright filing was denied because it did not contain at least a minimum amount of original pictorial or graphic authorship or authorship in sound. Atari appealed, of course they did. And in Atari Games Corp versus Oman, the Court of Appeals Justice found that the work was copyrightable. And that Court of Appeals Justice was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Atari was unable to use Wozniak's design. By designing the board with as few chips as possible, he made the design difficult to manufacture. It was too compact and, com and complicated to be feasible with Atari's manufacturing methods. But Wozniak claims that Atari could not understand the design, and he speculates that maybe some engineer there was trying to make some kind of modification to it. Atari ended up designing their own version for production, which contained about 100 TTL chips. But Wozniak found the game to be the same as his original creation, and he could not find any differences. So, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Steve Jobs, and Steve Wozniak, all in one story. This, of course, is the big one, released in 1978. This was also created by Tomohiro Nishikado of Taito, and it grossed $3.8 billion. It's the highest grossing video game of all time, of course it is. It expanded the video game industry from a novelty to a global industry. Built with an Intel 8080 chip again, and a bitmap frame buffer, and still in monochrome using cellophane on the display. It was the first game to use music throughout play rather than just as an intro or as a closing theme. And although the melody is simple, it's simply four descending tones. Doom, 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 doom. It's compelling and it's firmly embedded in pop culture. Now, meanwhile, back in the home, the availability of cathode ray tube displays, TV sets, meant that home entertainment systems could be com commercialized. So the Magnavox Odyssey was designed by Ralph Baer at Sanders Associates and was released in 1972 and sold 350,000 units. It could display three dots and a line of varying height, which is not much to be going on, but they added plastic overlays for the TV screen. And this formed the basis for 28 games, including table tennis, which inspired Pong and 20 years of lawsuits. Which, was not, which were not made much better by the release of Home Pong in 1975 by Atari. So Harold Lee, who was a staff engineer at Atari, proposed a home version developed with Alan Alcorn. It used a single chip and it was sold through the Sears catalogue. And this was all while Magnavox was busy trying to sue Atari for ripping off tennis. I'm just going to talk about the Coleco Telstar there. I'll slip that in. It was released in 1976 as a Pong clone. 
Um, but they had they sold 14 variants uh, of the Coleco Telstar, each playing slightly different games. And they had great names like Ranger and Alpha, Regent, Sportsman, Combat, Marksman, the Coleco Calamatic, and the Coleco Colortron, and the Galaxy, and the Gemini. They obviously really love the forward forward moving names. Um, this is the Fairchild Channel F. F is for fun. And this was launched in November 1976, also sold about 350,000. Now, this was the first console to use plastic cartridges for games, which contained ROM chips. So it was the first programmable console. 27 cartridges were released, including a chess game. Now, it was a decent bit of kit, but it was beaten by this, which was the 800 pound gorilla in the home console battle of the late 70s. It sold 30 million throughout its lifetime. And although it was sold by Atari, Nolan Bushnell had by now sold up to Warner Communications in 1976. He just didn't have the breadth to build something of such, <laughs> so, so huge. It retailed at $200, which in today's money is about enough to buy you two PlayStations. Didn't have an 8080 processor. This one had a 6502 processor. And the games eventually exceeded the ROM in size, and it was to, which uh, these games were developed by third parties. It was the first console to get third party development. Activision, who you may have heard of, were formed to develop games for the Atari 2600. Activision actually published the early Total War titles. Now, this is the Magnavox Odyssey 2 or the Odyssey Squared, depending on which piece of documentation you read. It was sold in Europe actually as the Philips Video Pack G7000. Sold 2 million editions, about 60 games in total. And it featured a speech synthesis add-on unit and also a membrane keyboard that you can probably make out there. There was a cartridge called Computer Intro. And the idea of that cartridge was to teach programming. So Mattel Electronics in 1979, uh, and also which reached the UK in 1981 released the Intellivision. This sold about 3 million. Again, third party games on cartridges and it also it was also supposed to feature a keyboard add-on for titles like um, crosswords and, uh, and for conversational French uh, and productivity software for home finances and personal improvement and self-education. All these sorts of, all sorts of great things were planned but the keyboard component was enormously late uh, and it ended up being cancelled in 1982. Mountain H2 brings us to the rise of home computing, although we probably have to go back to 1980. So back in the UK, Clive Sinclair's chief engineer, Jim Westwood, designed a new microcomputer based on a Zilog Z80 microprocessor, which is a bit like an Intel 8080. It introduced the ZX80 in February 1980, and it came as a kit at 80 pounds and ready built for an additional 20 pounds. So you could get this in the post, build it yourself and have a computer up and running in your own home. The next year in March, the ZX81 was launched and that was just 50 pounds as a kit and it was ready built for 70. And then 13 months later in April 1982, the device that you see there in the screen, the ZX Spectrum was launched, but only as a ready built machine for 125 pounds. It contained 16K of RAM and an additional 50 pounds brought you a further 32 kilobytes of RAM. I was 13 years old when I started saving for a ZX81. And my parents helped me buy one for my 14th birthday. And then they bought me a ZX Spectrum for my 15th birthday. I was very fond of them and of my parents as well. They all came with a cassette tape interface for loading and storing data. The squeal of data traveling into the machine was still a part of popular culture well into the 90s when people started connecting to the internet on modems. Of course, Acorn Computers, they were the other success story in the UK computing team. Um, they launched the Atom in March 1980, and my school bought one of these during the summer holidays. This was the first machine that I wrote code for, and it was the first machine I wrote a game for during the autumn of 1980. And this is what prompted me to start saving for a ZX81. I saw an advert for it in the Radio Times. The next machine was called the Proton, which was released in December 1981, but it was released as the BBC microcomputer, uh, following an initiative by the BBC to improve computer literacy nationally. And there were ongoing battles in the playground about which was the best machine, rather like football team comparisons, only with less shouting. The best machine was the one that ran the software you wanted to run, as always, and it took me ages to figure that one out. Moving through the 80s, the BBC Spectrum battle was replaced by the Atari Amiga battle, and this was released, well the Atari ST was released in June 1985. This was a beauty, 
It contained high resolution bitmap color graphics and shipped with a mouse to operate its graphic user interface. It came with half a megabyte of RAM and was powered by a Motorola 68000 processor. It also featured two MIDI ports, which made it the device of choice for musicians. And of course, Commodore. Here's a picture of a Commodore Amiga. It was released about a month after the Atari, and it was a superior machine, which was reflected in the price. It was about $3,000 in today's money. It was 50% more than the Atari ST. It didn't come with MIDI ports either. Various commentators have remarked that if it had done, the ST would have been discontinued much sooner. Now, writing games for the Spectrum and the ST was my majority pursuit during the 80s. And we'll look at the languages I used for this in more detail shortly, but I learned so much about the hardware that stitches them all together and maintains communication between the component parts. The number of games available for these machines was phenomenal. Distribution media were very cheap compared to the ROM cartridges of consoles, and the available titles numbered well into the thousands, which of course had a dreadful impact on quality. Meanwhile, for those more interested in pure gaming, the console market continued to produce some beauties. So this is the Nintendo Entertainment System released in Japan in 1983 and throughout Europe in September 1986. This is where Super Mario Brothers and The Legend of Zelda made their debut. They were game franchises that are now nearly 40 years old. They competed with Sega and the Master System and variants of this device are still being released in Brazil. Their rivalry, Sega and Nintendo, continued into the 90s as the Sega Mega Drive and the Super Nintendo Entertainment System competed for gaming hours. These machines supported 16-bit processors and all kinds of increasingly complicated sound and graphics hardware to deliver engaging content. Now, 3DFX were a company that made hardware for arcade games and realised in the mid-90s that they could create add-in cards for PCs due to the dramatic price drop of a particular type of DRAM. Extended Dynamic Out EDM DRAM. Um, and I remember the first time I saw one of these beauties, I was playing Tomb Raider, and my friend knocked on my front door, holding one in his hands, and we put it in my machine, and suddenly Tomb Raider became extraordinary. Everything was painted in 3D, the frame rating improved, the resolution was higher. It was an extraordinary moment. So in the same year, the Sony PlayStation was released with 3D hardware, and this made the Sega Saturn and the Super Nintendo Entertainment System look rather shabby. And in tandem with dynamic marketing in nightclubs and advertising on TV, it became absolutely the must-have item and sold 100 million units in under 10 years. The 3D was the big feature, big feature of the 90s, and graphics hardware multiplied accordingly. There were so many different 3D graphics cards you could stick into your machine. So Microsoft launched the DirectX programming interface in September 1995. And the idea behind this was to simplify the process of developing for Windows machines. Suddenly the PC became the platform of choice for the most performance hungry and dedicated of gamers. The Nintendo 64 sported a 64-bit processor, but the hardware race started to slow down though as people cared less about the hardware and more about the titles. Companies like Sony and Nintendo had strong franchises to sell their hardware with. As the 90s drew to a close, Sega released the Dreamcast, its last console, completely dominated by the PlayStation 2. Microsoft moved into its place with the Xbox. Now the gaming market is now differentiated along three axes. The first of these is console hardware. So this is a PlayStation 5. Like the Xbox, it can now be characterized as a consumer PC with a fancy case and a custom operating system. It features a modified AMD Zen 2 CPU, a modified AMD GPU, and some familiar ancillary components on the motherboard. The Xbox Series X also features a modified AMD Zen 2 processor and a modified AMD GPU. GPU stands for graphic processor units, sorry, I should probably make that clear. In fact, here's one for you. Because it's the graphics card that differentiates the PC, this is the NVIDIA RTX 3090. It's a beast. It is sought after by cryptocurrency miners and also by machine learning researchers because these cards are simply massively parallel linear algebra engines. They produce far better results than any console GPU, but it comes at considerable cost. In fact, one of these cards will set you back more than any console. 
Okay. He remembers this from 2007. So let me, I've got a camera here so you can see what I'm doing with my finger for a few seconds. And uh, let me go ahead and get that picture within picture up. I'm going to go ahead and just push the sleep wake button. And there we go, right there. And to unlock the phone, I just take my finger and slide it across. All right? You want to see that again? I will like, see it again. We wanted something that you couldn't do by accident in your pocket and just slide it across. Boom. So, yes, slides to unlock the crowd went wild. Now, I used to go into schools to persuade youngsters to consider a career in STEM. And back in the early part of this century, that's a sentence I never thought I'd be saying, I would say that I'm a game developer and I'd ask if anyone played computer games. And a couple of nervous hands would raise reluctantly, not wanting to join up to being somebody who played games. But now everyone is playing games on their phones. Gaming has become embedded in contemporary culture. It whiles away the moments at the bus stop. Or whilst you're waiting for your tea to brew, it fills the cracks in your life. The relentless advance in hardware has enabled immersive gaming in the palm of your hand. Let's look at how to write a game. How do you actually write a game? Right, well, I'm sure you've all played games of one kind or another, like chess or drafts or knots and crosses, or maybe even Risk or Monopoly or Cluedo. So what you have to do, first of all, is read and understand the rules. Pick up a new game, you read and understand the rules. Knots and Crosses, quite simple rules. Monopoly, less so. Risk, really quite extraordinary. Settlers of Qatar, phew. explaining rules to humans can be very hard work. It's an iterative process that carries on until you all reach consensus about how to play a game. Now imagine doing that to a computer. So let's consider a game. Yes, Pong. Right, back to the chat window. I want you all to take 30 seconds and add some rules to the chat about how to play Pong. Go, I'm gonna drink some water. Mmm. Ah, right. All these are screen pointers scored. Must it boil the net? Or is it a contact with the flat? Slide up and down to hit the ball. Sammy, 811. Congratulations, Sammy. Right, I know that some of you are simply sending messages to all panelists. Above your chat window, you'll see a drop down box that says all panelists, or if you select it, we'll say all panelists and attendees. I recommend you choose all panelists and attendees and everyone can see your answer. We had quite a lot of answers there. Only a few went to all attendees. They were pretty good though. So let's just take a look at what I came up with. So I divided the rules into three sections, the ball, the bats, the score and the duration. So you can think of this as the pieces and the turn and the win condition. Oh, I've got some more answers coming in. People have discovered how to use Zoom chat. It's only taken a year. Right, if the ball hits a bat, it rebounds with perfect reflection. Yes, it does. Ooh, perfect reflection, I like the sound of that. Right, so the ball travels in a straight line at constant velocity, bounces off the top and bottom of the playing area and bounces off bats at the left and right. Angles, didn't think about angles, thank you for that. Bats are controlled by players. They move up and down along the y-axis. And if a ball reaches left or right and is not hit by a bat, then the ball leaves play and a point is scored. There's a finite number of serves, which nobody remarked on. Then we have to display the simulation. So the programme simulates the world described by the rules. If we want to see how the simulation is proceeding, we need a way of viewing it. So this game is attached to a screen, so we need a set of drawing instructions. So same drill, I want you all to take 30 seconds and add some drawing instructions to the chat. Yeah, go for it, Sally. Hmm. 
that is halfway between the sides. Yeah. So what I'm finding interesting about this set up sprites, yes. <laughs> Pick 60 or 50 hertz, scan lines for solid walls, take score to find ball. Now, quite a lot of these aren't actually drawing instructions. And the interesting thing that what I'm trying to demonstrate here is how so many people can disagree on how, how to do a thing. You have to unambiguously communicate with the computer. Um, so I simply have a set of five things to, to display. I said, draw the bats, draw the ball, draw the scores, draw the playing field boundary, draw the net. But how you apprehended the problem was completely different from how I apprehended the problem. X, Y coordinates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Finally, we have to control the simulation. So we have a set of rules and we have a view onto those rules. That's not enough for a game. You might decide that this is what the universe is, an absentee creator who set the rules, started the universe off, and retired to observe. And it depends on your faith model, I suppose. But a game needs to interact with the rules that it creates. So, saying Jill, what is under the control of players external to the system? Mm. Ah, this is great. Resistance of potentiometers. That's a very low level of abstraction. Move paddles vertically, press button to serve. Start and pause game. Start, stop, pause, restart. Yes. How much rotation causes how much vertical movement? Yeah. I was just thinking about bats and service. That's all we have. An arcade machine may actually have a start button and serve automatically rather than serve each ball so that people aren't waiting at the machine, not pressing the serve button. This is a simple game. Okay, we designed that in what, a couple of minutes. So let's move forward a few years and consider something a little more involved. Yep, Space Invaders. Let's take a look at this in action. take it is not beyond the wit of man to realize that if one of those bombs hits the missile launcher then that's the end of the, that's the end of the, the, the particular round but we're going to take the same process so first we'll model the rules but we'll need to break it up a little though so we're going to consider the invaders first so 30 seconds to describe the invader rules Bottom of the invader releases bomb. Yes. Which red ship point is destroyed the invaders before they reach the bottom and don't get killed. Okay, so thank you, Sammy. Keep typing your name so I know it's you. Die of hit by missile. The very first NPC. Yes, 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 they actually are characters. Although I would imagine. No, no, in gunfight, they were player characters. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's look at what I came up with. So I came up with four rules. Invaders move side to side until a row hits a wall, when they drop a row and change direction. Then the bottommost invaders periodically drop a bomb. The invader speed is inversely proportional to the number of invaders remaining. They get faster as there are fewer invaders. And the spaceship randomly traverses the top of the screen. 
So that's just the invader rules about how they move and what they do. So let's try some rules for the missile platform at the bottom. 30 seconds. Come on, Sammy, don't let me down. The A sound. Lose life. Hmm. Like choose life only worse. Damage, damage. That's not really the missile platform. Okay. Let's try and see what I came up with. So the missile platform starts in the center of the x-axis. Actually, that's wrong. Looking at that screen, I realize it starts at the left at x equals at uh, x equals zero. Uh, the missile platform moves along the x-axis, and then the missile platform launches missiles upwards, and the missile platform is controlled by the player. Okay. So the final part is a little harder. Let's model the conditions that govern the order of play. This is of the form, if X happens, then Y happens. So we'll do this in two sections. First, the invader conditions, and then the missile conditions. So 30 seconds on the invaders, please. This is much more fun live, I'm sure. I'd love to do this one live. I've really missed speaking to audiences actually over the past year. I seem to have become a YouTuber. Mm. Blocks which move sideways to shoot down the aliens. Yeah, thank you, Sammy. Quite a, lot of, quite a lot of good answers here. Right. Space motors on the CPM. Yep, absolutely. Good show. Right. Let's see what I came up with. I wasn't so good at finding an even division of the rules. That was really the problem. But here we have. If bomb hits a shelter, then the shelter decays. If bomb hits the missile platform, then the player loses a life. If player loses three lives and the game is over, if the bottom most invaders reach the bottom, player loses all lives. If all invaders are destroyed, a new set appears, new shelters appear. Right, finally, for this section, the missiles. So 30 seconds. The missiles are what go up. The bombs are what drop down. So we just want a rule set for the missiles, please. Only graphics per clock cycle. Mm -hmm. Missile going up destroys first thing it hits. Yes, because physics. Do you know, I should have had a little 30 second jingle to play whilst this bit was going on. Only one missile can fire at a time. Yes. So I'll shoot in between the bunkers, shoot all the way through the invaders. Yep. Thank you, Sam. Get boxes on shelters and invaders. Should the missile detect a collision or the invader? That is a very, very, very good question. All right, time is, oh God, it's 10 to 8, do excuse me. Right, I'm going to tear through this, that's it longer than I was expecting. But you can see how it's getting harder and harder as the game becomes more complex. I imagine if we were all in one room, there would be discussion or even arguments about what the easiest way to represent the rules is to enable efficient encoding. So to hold that thought. Oh, I hope you've read all that. If the missile is in play, another cannot be launched. Yes, we did that. If it's shelter, shelter decays, missile disappears, yep. Uh, if missile hits bomb, both disappear. I don't think anybody came up with that one. Somebody will correct me if they did, I'm sure. Um, yes, but the disappearing thing is important. 
Right, next we have to display the simulation. So I hope this is an easier job. So what are our drawing instructions going to be? Just group and list the things that we have to draw. Bit of specific coordinates, draw spikes from remaining aliens, missiles and bombs, invaders, bombs, missiles, platform scores. Thank you, Stu. Shelters. Make the missile fire at invaders, bunkers, so yeah. Just remaining lives. And credits, yes. I think I missed credits out from the answer now that I think about it. Credits and lives remaining. Bunker, bunker damage, yeah, how do we, how do we represent the bunker damage? Any movement speeds is inversely proportional to the number of aliens left, that's, yep. Panelists, I have to dash, massive thank you, all the recording we sent out to participants. Lloyd, I don't think you're in the spirit of this. <laughs> oh, that was just the panelists, oh, I'm so sorry. Right. <laughs> High score, right, crack on. So I came up with eight sets of things, invaders, shelters, bombs, missiles, missile launcher, spaceship, score, and remaining lives. I didn't put down the number of credits. All right, look, finally, we have to control the simulation. This should be, uh, this should be easier, shouldn't it? I hope you're getting the hang of this. Move launcher. Platform moves by player input. Yep. Fire by player input. Move joystick left or right. Press button to fire missiles. Yep. Fire. Had you effect random time move left. Coin in coin input. Mm. In terms of broken XY keys after hitting them too hard. Yes. We need to find the keys. Feed it money. They are such hungry beasts. Yeah, there was a myth that the uh, 300 gen coin went into, became rare after the release of Space Invaders. But this wasn't true. Um, the Japanese bank had actually reduced the number of coins they were minting anyway. Because obviously, you know, if you're an arcade operator, you're going to take this big bucket of coins every day and hand it back to the bank in exchange for a credit to your balance. Right. Time to make short. So yes, just three things. There's a timer update that we need to worry about now. Um, controlling the simulation, we have the missile launchers and the missile, the missile launcher, there's only one missile launcher, and the missiles. Uh, so the missile launcher is the X, Y button or the joystick and the missile launching is a button there, but there's also a timer update, which is external to the system. There's some kind of device that's timing, that's keeping everything going. Um, the invaders speed up as they become fewer, now, I expect that that was never actually managed in, in the first place. I imagine what happened was that the game cycle would collect the input, update everything, draw it, and that's it. And the amount of time to do all that diminished as the number of invaders declined, which sped up the entire game cycle. Right, how to program for games. So the engineer's role has changed considerably over the years. I hope you can see that. The first games were strictly hardware problems and not until gunfight was there a software requirement of the developer. Now, I have no need whatsoever to provide any hardware engineering. My entire job is software development. Sony, Nintendo, Microsoft, all these people abstract away the entire hardware platform for me. So let's look at the programming languages that I've used to write games. I'm going to be tearing through these. I've overrun dreadfully. I'm terribly sorry. So my first language was basic, beginner's all-purpose symbolic instruction code. The very idea of writing a game in a high-level language seemed entirely peculiar five years before this volume was published. My first basic was in fact Atom Basic, um, but I've got no recollection of the manual. I think the maths teacher, Mr. Ridge at Richard Lander School in Truro, if you're out there, thank you so much, sir, you are the finest teacher. But I reckon he put it somewhere for safekeeping and merely let us type in programs from magazines and so on. And I've highlighted four characteristics here. It's an interpreted language, which means that there's um, another program interpreting and executing the commands, this is so very slow and so very suboptimal. It's very easy, very easy. If you execute a loop a dozen times, the basic interpreter would carry out the same interpretation a dozen times. 
rather than caching it. And in fairness, such optimization was expensive for a four kilobyte ROM. I'm amazed that they managed to cram an interpreter into something so small, to be perfectly honest. Um, but basic, it was just so easy. It took me a day or so to pick up the gist of what was going on, to control flow and to manage state. But unfortunately, programs written for one machine, for the ZX81, for example, would not work on another. This was not a portable way of writing code. Now, Z80 on the other hand, well, I have a game speed problem by dispensing with the basic interpreter entirely and moving down to the CPU instead. So programming the Z80 by Rodney Zax is an amazing book, an amazing book. I still have my copy. I was at a conference a few years ago and I just mentioned in a lightning talk that I was doing, programming the Z80 by Rodney Zax. A surprising number of people actually have a copy of this book. So Z80 is assembled rather than interpreted it is turned into a program that the CPU can execute. And it was a rather more complex piece than basic. There are several hundred instructions with their own characteristics, but they follow a pattern informed by the design of the CPU. And I can honestly say that I was lucky to come across this book. If I hadn't done so, I suspect I would have floundered along for a few years and then become an actuary. Now, Programming the Z80 was published by, by Cybex, so when I moved on to the Atari ST, I picked up their 68000 programming manual. It wasn't quite so impactful, but I picked it up very swiftly. Both Z80 and 68000 were somewhat portable. Those parts of the programs that didn't interact directly with the I.O. systems could be used on different machines. Let's see. see, I wrote games all through the 80s in assembly, although I did pick up C along the way. Now C is a compiled language rather than an assembled language. It goes through more phases of translation and takes a little longer to build. Now, when I was making games, I would expect to assemble and go in under a second. I'd be, I'd be there with the source code, I'd stick to get and go, and it would build and start running immediately. And it wasn't until the 90s that I started to hear of games being written using C. Um, Doom was released in 1993. It was written in C with the exception of the line drawing algorithm, which was hand rolled in x86 assembly. The raw speed was entirely sufficient for most purposes, frankly. Outpacing the compiler with handwritten code was a thing of the past. C was extremely portable as well, as long as you stayed within the standard libraries. This book, this is also an amazing book. People ask why C was so successful, while so many other languages fell by the wayside. I think this book is the answer. It is extremely well written. It is brief. It is accessible. I, I recommend it to anyone. Finally, C++. So I, I wrote my first game commercially for Codemasters in 1997 through 1999. It's called Prince Nazim Boxing. It wasn't a happy project. It dragged on for months and months, well, years, as you can see. I actually stopped working there before it was finished. So that's two years of my life working on a title that I can't find it. I really can't find much trace of it other than um, a, a Eurogamer review, which gave it five out of 10, one to miss. It was released a year after I left Codemasters. I wrote my part of the project in C++ prior to standardization. It was, it was okay. 20 years later, you might ask yourself if it's easier or harder than C. Now, my experience of C is too small to compare now. But C++ does have a reputation as a tough language. But over the past 10 years, it's become easier and easier to use with each revision. Every three years, a new version comes out, and it just simplifies things all the time. It remains portable and fast. And the excellent abstraction facilities do make it ideal for a team environment. So we have a methodology of model rules, view world, and control input. Three things, model, view, control. How do we make a total war game? Well, I thought you'd never ask. Take a look at this.
Sammy, I hope you don't get nightmares. Sorry about that. I should probably have thought about it. Warning ahead. And this is a team trailer. Anyway, it's beautiful stuff, isn't it? Really. You know? <laughs> right. I'm going to dash through these slides. Um, so, actually, by the power of abstraction, I could probably do that, although in less detail than I was intending. The rules are very complex for Total War. They're ludicrously so. They need to entertain for hours and hours. And part of the fun of this game is learning the rules, just like life, really. Um, the game divides neatly into two. There is a turn-based strategy game, which is rather like Risk, and there's a real-time battlefield game, which is always show off all of our rendering prowess. The strategy game consists of a number of factions, who are the players, and a big box of resources. The resources are cities with human populations who respond to good and bad civic and military leadership. Yes, you can, you can, you can manage the cities, you can change how much you're going to spend on sewage, and how much you're going to spend on policing and public order. It's great fun, it really is. It sells well in Germany as well. Um, the cities produce soldiers and public servants and commodities for trading. Faction leaders decide how to deploy those resources, whether to improve their trade with your neighbours or absorb them after waging war. The win condition is simply to survive. So war is prosecuted on the battlefield. We have infantry and mounts and artillery with cities to besiege and walls and entrances. And we have siege engines. You have to take the city or rout the enemy to win if there's no city around. Displaying the simulation itself is a huge task. Um, rendering is an entirely separate discipline in itself. It has its own conferences. If you remember the picture of that graphics card, the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3090, there's a different kind of processor on there. It's not a CPU, it's a GPU. It's a different program model. What you do is you write individual kernels called shaders for different types of rendering. Rendering the battlefield has exterior lighting conditions to take into account, whereas rendering the campaign is more like a board game. Now we control the simulation with a user interface to capture all of the user intent. On the battlefield, this means directing troops to locations at particular speeds, focusing their efforts on particular targets. Now we have an AI, yeah I know I said it, but we have an AI which has the same set of controls as the human player and the same set of information. So this is a multiplayer game, which means we have to collect input from around the internet. And this also comes in the form of controls as indicated by the UI. So the UI, the AI and the network all control the model, or they all feed control to the model. So that's model and view and control. That's how you write a Total War game. Just like how you write Pong and Space Invaders, you start off with a model with some rules. You start off with, uh, you have a view, so you can look at the model. And then you have a way of controlling input to the model. That's a game. That's how you write a game. That's all you do. That's all you do. The rest is just a matter of scale. It really is all just a matter of scale. The history of computer games has been one of scale. Hardware has grown in capability. Teams have grown ever larger. Audiences have grown as well. Um, my role as an engineer over this time, and I'm a mathematician, not an engineer, but you know, I'm doing engineering things, even though I learned how to wield a soldering iron and make simple projects. My role has been entirely software based. I started off writing entire games on my own, armed with an intimate knowledge of a specific operating environment. And my predecessors were the same. Pong was built by one man, Alan Alcorn. And through the 80s, as hardware improved, more people were thrown at different parts of the game and specialisms were formed. Artists, artists started developing resources. Artists who didn't know one end of a soldering iron from another. Total War now has over a hundred programmers. My role remains quite low level, but we have people who do machine learning research, which is far, far removed from the operation of the computer. That's just maths. The future shows more of the same. I don't know what the limiting factor is. Communication between all the programmers is challenging. Um, but raising the abstractions so that individual teams work on well-defined sections seems to have served us well so far. Long, long may it be so. So that's, that's it. Many thanks for attending the talk. I'm open for questions. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have a number of questions here, which uh, I'll uh, I'll take you uh, take you through. Uh, uh -huh. The first is from Mike Underhill, who asks: Is there any evidence that playing computer games improves human intelligence, and in what way? I do not know. I don't play <laughs> to improve my intelligence. Um, 
there are, there is it, a lot of people do a lot of research though on how people play games. I know that to be the case. For me, their life's too short to read all that research. I have to say, <laughs> rather than um, you know, I let other people deal with the impact. Um, I'm sure it will, will yield, yield results. And I'm sorry, that's not the question. That's not the answer you wanted. But unfortunately, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so the next question is: How did the gaming market recover from the crash of '83, and what console or game brought it back from the poor, poor quality game? Ooh, wow, that's a great question, actually. Um, I think, so the early 80s was an interesting period. I think through the 70s, we were all basically playing tennis and variants on tennis, and we call them hockey by introducing different walls, or have an extra couple of bats and say it's football or soccer or something like that. And, and, and you know, the wrong cartridges, uh, game design was still very much stuck in kind of bat ball, bat ball thing, really. Um, when you know the homebrew computer home, homebrew computer club kicked off in the late seventies in, in the Bay Area, and when people started actually writing code and writing their own stuff and making their own games, um, there was more ability to, to to prototype games to make games really quickly. And so through the early eighties, with you know with the Spectrum and the BBC and the Commodore VIC twenty, I should have said the Commodore VIC twenty and the Commodore sixty four, but with all of these machines, um, more and more people were actually able to start just you know, playing at making games. Um, and I think that's, that sort of, that, that, that created a culture of, of prototyping and speculating and, and seeing what worked. I think when Nintendo released the Nintendo Entertainment System in 83, um, the people who built those games were probably prototyping on computers and were having a great time actually making a game more quickly and not committing to all the hardware of it all. I'm obviously speculating wildly here. I wasn't there. I haven't asked. So them. it was a it was oh. a collaborative effort rather than a single uh, incident or, or product. Yeah. Okay. I mean, certainly you can look at you can look at, uh, at Zelda and, and, and Super Mario Brothers and go, oh well, that did it. And it, they were yeah. very popular games. But I think it's actually mm -hmm. the fact that people that, that making games became cheaper to do sure. cognitively. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Next one. You'll like. Uh, <laughs> why is C the most preferred? The language most preferred for game development. Well, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> the the two-minute version, guy. <laughs> two-minute version. I don't know that I have one that short. Um, okay. <laughs> Look, um, so, full disclosure. First of all, um, I represent the United Kingdom to the International Standards Organization uh, for C++. So that means that I and a bunch of other people on in the British Standards Institute. Um, we, we come up with, you know, we, we help shepherd C++ into the future. We help develop new features for it. So uh, I, the only reason I do that is because I love C++ and think it's amazing. So you cannot expect anything like an unbiased answer or an objective answer. Mm -hmm. It's just not physically possible. That right. said, C was used in games all throughout the 80s, uh, through the 90s, I mean. Um, in the 80s, it was all assembly, but in the 90s, people, you know, started migrating to C. One of the things that C++ gives you is abstraction facilities that make it easier to develop in larger teams. I think that's the that's the winning feature of C++. With C, you've got structs and you've got functions and you have data and that's it. You don't have encapsulation and abstraction. You kind of have encapsulation, but it's quite poorly defined. C++ has spent the past hmm, 30, no, 20, 30, uh, 20. Yeah, the past 20 or so years going through subsequent revisions to improve its feature set. When Bjorn Struistrup started writing C with classes in the, in the early 80s, he wanted, he, he wanted to create something with better abstraction facilities, but, but at zero cost. So, you, you know, you don't end up paying for what you don't use. And I think it's those, that, that increase in the quantity of abstraction mm -hmm. that, makes, that makes C++ a better choice. Compile, compile, yeah. C compilers outpaced C++ compilers for a long time, but now there's, you know, there's just no difference. We have some amazing people writing C++ compilers that generate fabulous code. So the, the fact that it's, it's, it's those abstraction facilities that, that probably sell it for yeah. everyone. Okay, uh, so the next question is, what's the most difficult part of designing or developing video games? Which subject at college or uni should I be looking at to get into the industry? 
Well, a question uh, of two parts. Okay, question two parts. I'll start with the second part because I'm contrary. If you want to get into the video games industry, you have to decide what you want to do. There are, well, we have, as far as I know, we have 50 individual roles. That's like, we have 800 people at Creative Assembly. And I think we have 50 individual roles at Creative Assembly. So there's plenty to choose from. Um, you know, besides testing engineers, we also have audio developers. Uh, we have artists, animators, texturers, um, we, riggers, our programs, we have so many different types of programmers as well. And there's also you know, non-engineering talent, non-development talent. We have um, uh, operations managers, we have production people who make sure that we deliver everything on time. Um, we have, um, we've got an IT department, we've got a great IT department that makes sure that we, we actually have the hardware that we need to keep the thing running. Um, and, you know, we have plenty of unsung heroes, but they all go on the credits, you know, uh, everybody, you know, um, Kimberly Six, front of house, lovely lady. I don't know that she can write code, but she's great at being in front of house and she keeps the company running. There's, there, there, there are many roles that you can go for. So I wouldn't look at your final destination whilst you're pursuing your studies. I think what you should do, what I did, you should do what you enjoy, okay? You will be better at what you enjoy than what you feel you have to do. Now, the thing to do is do the things that you enjoy worry about direction later just do the things that you do go through academia you know do your gcses do your a levels do your degree and just do things that you enjoy and use that to learn how to learn and learn how to meet people and network and make friends and things like that so the first part of the question what is the hardest part of developing a game mm -hmm. is uh <laughs> it depends on the game it depends on the size of the game actually <sighs> debugging actually i think debugging is the hardest part um Software development comes in two parts. There's actually writing the code, which can be quite mechanical. There are lots of ways of, of, of putting stuff together. Um, but then there's finding the errors. And that's just an art that you get through practice. You know, there's, there's no, you know, there, there, there are techniques and tricks and things that you do. When I was at university, I was advised to write a book on differential equations by Polya, I think it was Polya, Herbert Polya. Somebody can idea. But the first page, the introductory page, after the table of contents, it says the way to solve a differential equation is to look at it until the answer occurs to you and then it is solved. And that's what debugging is like. You just look at it and then you go, ah, oh! and there's that, there's that moment of inspiration. And that's why debugging is the hardest thing because you have no control over it. You really are at the mercy of your own experience and your persistence and your wit. So I, I vote debugging as the hardest part. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the next one, quite a long question, but uh, I'll read it. Uh, you might recall in 95, an interview with Steve Jobs, where he talks about PepsiCo, John Scully, and how the company ended up driven by its marketing and sales department. He then explains that the same can happen in technology companies and compares this to Xerox and IBM. Now it's postulated. We're seeing the same pattern prevalent in some of the biggest companies in the games industry. Do you have concerns over the loss of creative autonomy for developers when their management becoming increasingly economically motivated? None at all. None at all. Um, it's a job, first of all, and it's a business. You know, we make games and we, you know, we make games that people want to buy and then they buy them and they give us money and then we use that money to pay people and to pay the bills and then we make more games. That's, that's how it works. If you make a game that nobody wants to play, then you don't get to make any more games. <laughs> you know, or you only get to make games in your spare time after your day job. And that's fine, you can, you can do that. You can make games on your own in your spare time after your day job. It's harder because you're on your own and you don't have the infrastructure of a, of a game company to support you. But, you know, so there's a good synergy between creativity and economic success. Well, that's right. People can have people have great. I mean, you know, during the during the during the eighties, when I was making games, I'd have great ideas for games, and I'd try them out, and I'd realise, oh, you can't do that, and that was problematic. But nowadays, you know, people have ideas for games, and you know, you just try it out. You just try it out yeah. in something like Unreal or Unity, and you process and you say, hey, this plays well, and then you and then you build it, and then okay. Somebody might give us some money to do it, or they might not. Okay, next question. Do you use unit and integration tests for Total War? 
Um, well, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, we're moving on to that. Historically, um, it has to be said that game, game engineering has been the, um, what's the word? Ah, it's, it's the bedroom coder is the traditional, we, don't, we just make the game until it works and then go on to something else. And so discipline in writing and testing, uh, uh, in writing unit tests has been, has been low. And over the past few years, we've started to use unit testing. Um, but if you remember what I was saying about nobody dies, you know, the, game, the, the code is not sufficiently life-threatening to worry sufficiently about the code going wrong to spend time writing unit tests. What game developers want to do is write the game, make the game, make the game. Yeah. Now, you know, the wisdom of that has, <laughs> has eroded somewhat as, um, you know, the cost of writing games increases. You don't want to be writing bugs, yeah. eliminating bugs as soon as you can, and unit tests are absolutely great for that. So it depends where you go. You might find in a small studio, it's all seat of the pants stuff, but I think as more and more money is thrown at something then the importance of unit tests becomes sure, increasingly sure. manifest. Okay, kind of related. Do you use an agile development approach? How does that fit in with your concept of establishing the rules of the game at the start? Genius question. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we do actually. Um, the thing is, it's a process of continual refinement. You know, we set out the rules of the game. Um, so let's look at the Total War franchise. This has been running for what, 20 years, now 22 years, 21 years, a long time. Um, now Total War games, it's, it's false to say that a Total War game is completely different. Um, with every, you know, there are some parts of the game which persist from, from release to release. That's what makes the Total War game. You've got grand scale, epic battlefields, you've got a campaign map, you've got risk and lo risk of loss you can resource money you know those are the things that make up a total war game but as we move from game to game we change things like we'll change the um uh, the, the the period of, of conflict you know we've done the shogun period shogun shogunate era we've done the uh, ancient rome we've done um renaissance europe um you know we, we've done all sorts of different parts and so what we find is that we have the game and then as the next game comes along it's going to be right we're going to do this now and then we come up with a set of rules and then we try them out we prototype them and then we, we and, and we we iterate we iterate until we get the rules that are compelling that make interesting gameplay um regarding agile um we can't you know we have a we've developed our own agile methodology basically that's the thing i i can't i don't actually like the agile manifesto um you know it's it's it was written by a bunch of you know middle-aged men in the early in the early 90s <laughs> And um, you know it. It doesn't accommodate. It doesn't like it doesn't accommodate people who can only work, you know, on you know working mothers, for example, or mothers who have children to take care of, or people with disabilities, or you know, they, they, mm -hmm. there's all sorts of things wrong with the Agile Manifesto. It does need a 21st century update to make it more inclusive sure. uh, of, yeah. of, of a broader representation of the population. One of the problems, yeah. you know, we we have a real a real diversity problem in software engineering. We really really mm -hmm. do. It used to be, like up until about the early 80s, um, the number of women who were studying computing was about the same as the number of men. Um, and then there's this point in about 1983 where the graph just tails off. I think that that was because of the introduction of home computers as devices by which you could bring the arcade into your home. And arcades at the time were gladiatorial places where boys would hang out and play games. And so suddenly computers arcades, boys, it, 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 it kind of implicitly became a gendered thing. And we just saw this tail off of women. I'd, I'd love to address that somehow. Um, it's, you know, <laughs> we don't have enough software engineers. We have, sure. we have some big problems that need software engineering yep. solutions and we don't have enough, sorry. Yeah. I'm quite passionate about this. <laughs> you have to give me off the surface. Okay, moving on to the next question. Software has a reputation for being buggy and delivered late. Has game software development overcome these issues? And if so, how? Um, yes, yeah, software's buggy. I don't think there's any such thing as the final bug. Although having said that, Donald Knuth, who developed Tech, which is a typesetting program, he offered a bug bounty, which doubled every year. Um, I think the last, so the first year, each bug was paid a cent. The second year, each bug was paid two cents. The last bug bounty check he wrote, I think, was for $2.56. Um, mm -hmm. And no one has found any bugs since then. So nearly all code has bugs in. Um, mm -hmm. 
what you do with bugs, you know, there are so many different kinds of bugs. You know, is the, does this bug match what was designed? Was the design wrong in the first place? All that sort of thing. The way that you militate, mitigate this is with testing. You know, we, we have an army of fantastic QA people who test the game, who play the game. You know, it sounds great. What's your job? I play games to make sure they work. Wow, sign me up right now. You know, that's, we, we get so many people. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the chocolate factory. But obviously, yeah. you've got to be very controlled about it. So we have, you yeah. know, we, we have people in QA who, do, who, who, who test things. That's how, we, you know, that's how we find the bugs. And then we have to just, we have to triage them. Is this a bug yeah. that we think we have time to fix? Is it too huge a fix? Is it too different? Is it a program bug? There's, we're on it. Same as any yeah. other industry, really. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I've, I've got two questions which I'll put together, kind of. Yeah. Uh, what computer program should I start with so I can learn to program games? Mm -hmm. um, and the other one was, would you suggest using C++ to begin a gaming career uh, for college or uni? Right. Um, I think it's very much your own, it's, it's your call. There's, I would obviously recommend C++ as the best way of getting a programming job in the games industry. Everyone's mm -hmm. writing C++. So if that's what you want to do, that's what you should do. But I first of all check that you actually have the aptitude and the temperaments to write C++ code. Um, you can have a lot of fun. Back to your earlier answer of well, what do you enjoy? I guess. Yeah, what do you enjoy? There are lots of ways of writing games. You know, you can write web games using JavaScript. That's actually quite fun. That's that's a great way of spending an afternoon. You know, get a bunch of friends around, write a game around a browser. You know, that's a game. It's not C++, but it's a game and it's fun. And it's a nice yeah. collaborative team activity for a miserable win Sunday winter, Sunday in winter. Um, yeah. So do what you like, you know, learn C++. You know, try learning C++. It's, it's a challenging language. Maybe you want to learn Python first or something like that. My next question is, as computer processing is increased, do you think higher level languages like Python will be used to create games in the future? Python already creates games. The reason why you use C++ is, so historically, um, the war in the, the battle, the, the, the competition was all about frame rate. How much can you squeeze out of the CPU? How many frames can you get per second? And how beautiful can you make those frames in that time? And the only way you can do that is by writing code that absolutely drives the CPU with, with not an inch of fat. So that's why we went to, that's why we programmed assembly and then C and then C++, so that we knew there, were no, there was no wasted processor cycles. And with the addition of graphics cards, we've now got entire teams of people who write in shader, who, who write in shader languages to create, to, to create shaders. Um, so, you know, you can write, you can do anything you like to write, you can use any language you like to create a game. It depends where you want to sell it and to whom you want to sell it. If you want to sell it to a, you know, a, cons a typical consumer, a typical gamer consumer, it's going to be in C++ if you want it on a console. So, um, kind of a related question perhaps. When writing software, how do you control the use of the CPU or the GPU? Uh, by measurement. You measure. You run the code, you say, ah, oh, this piece of code takes 0.38 seconds, or this code, ta well, this code takes 380 milliseconds, or this code takes, takes 64 microseconds, or this code takes 12 nanoseconds. It's extraordinary that we're, we're, we're not at a stage where we're, we're looking at execution times in terms of nanoseconds. It takes like a nanosecond to, to execute an instruction on the CPU. <laughs> um, that, that's still microcomputer. We're not, we're not in, we don't have microcomputers anymore. We don't have microprocessors anymore. We're onto nanoprocessors now, you know, we're, we're, yeah. we're it's such tiny scales. Um, yeah. So yeah, we control by measuring. You cannot okay. control what you cannot measure. Of course. So another question, What's your opinion on engines like Unity and Unreal, both from a creative perspective and their influence on the industry? Oh, controversial. Um, so Unity and game engines are great because they allow people to put their ideas into, into action. Um, you know, with a little bit of C++ or a little bit of C Sharp, you can crank up Unreal and you can, you can, you can get a game out. You can get a, a, a game looking thing out there. Um, Plenty of commercial games actually use Unreal and deliver deliver Unreal games. Um, it works. It does the trick. Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't like it. I like 
just as a personal preference, I like starting from the ground up and doing my own thing. One of the things that Unreal does is, right, if you want to learn to cook, there are two ways of learning to cook. You can either go out and buy Mada Jaffrey's classic tome on curry, or you can learn how to gut a fish. Okay, if you learn how to gut a fish, you will know how to cook a fish perfectly. Okay, if you go and buy Mada Jaffrey, you learn how to make a curry, but you won't, you know, you'll be limited by the constraints of what you learn. Now, with Unreal, you're kind of in the, you're, you're in the cookery book rather than the chef's school sort of side of things. And there's nothing wrong with developing games with Unreal. It produces, you know, empirically, it produces good results that people want to use. Personally, I want to learn to be, you know, a great C++ programmer. I want to be, a, you know, I want to be a great programmer. And Unreal will get me part of the way there, but it won't get me all of the way. And one problem that's learning programming through Unreal does is it only gives you half an education. If you, just, you know, if you decide games actually aren't for you, and there are plenty of people who do, you can't go into the finance industry and say, oh yeah, I can program C++ and Unreal. They will show you the door. So learn Unreal by all means, but don't stop there. It's, mm -hmm. only, it's only half, it's not, even, it's not even half the problem. A tool, but not the finished article. Yes. Okay, and I think the final question, Considering Margaret Hamilton was the first recognized software engineer, yep. not to mention the woman in her Apollo, yep. um, what do you think was the catalyst for the male dominance of the tech industry? Oh, uh, as that I explained. Is, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, as, 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 as I your earlier point. Once, once it, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, a different style of competition. It's, it's yeah. very sad. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got several others, but they're all congratulating you on an excellent talk, Guy. Thank you very so much. really, all I can do is add to that. I very much enjoyed it. I think it was a great talk. And uh, thank you very much for being here with us and your excellent answers to the questions, too. You're very welcome. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, thank I, you very much. I really enjoyed this. I hope you are. Um, if you want to have me back, give me another topic. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Guy. We'll we'll look at that. Okay, and thank you very much, very much, everybody. Uh, good night.